Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Good to see each of you. Good to see all of you to, together today in the house of the Lord. And welcome for a very special Palm Sunday service at our church today. Doesn't the choir look great? <laughs> They're all ready to sing, and we've got a great program planned for today. So, um, welcome to our guests today. If you're a guest in the service today, we hope that you'll feel welcome indeed and that you'll have a great time of worship together. If you are a guest and you haven't already filled out a guest card, or if you filled out a family registration out front, after the service, go by the welcome desk and there'll be a special gift for you. So. If you haven't filled out your name, address, phone number, whatever, uh, and any prayer requests that you might have, you'd like to share with us, other information, do so, and then stop by the welcome desk and you'll receive a very special gift. Today, before we go to prayer, I wanna mention several requests we have, folks in the church needing special prayer today. So we have Larry Ford, Larry's had surgery uh, at Morgantown. <clears throat> we'll be going back in a few days for more sur surgery. So keep Larry uh, in your prayers. Also, John and Tina Thaxon, they're traveling back to, back to Cleveland today. And tomorrow, both of them will be having surgery. Don and Tina both will be having procedural surgery tomorrow. Also want to mention Wanda McClung. I uh, haven't heard from her today, but yesterday I heard she was, she's in CAMC under hospice care. So pray for Wanda McClung today. Then we also want to remember the good people of Ukraine with all the struggles they're having with the war that's going on there, those who have lost loved ones and all the destruction that's been going on. And especially remember also our missionary who's there today, Eugene Kozinchenko. Kozinchenko. He and his son are now in Eastern Korea um, and they are possibly getting ready to be called up to military service. Eugene, in his email yesterday, said that he would be in the next uh, wave of those who are called up, if it goes that far, then his son would be in the next wave. So it's getting very serious there. Pray for our missionaries, not only him, but others and the churches of uh, Ukraine, so many. Uh, I think that's all the special requests I had mentioned today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and trust the Lord to bless, bless and make our service today a very special time indeed. Father God, we thank you today for the many blessings you bestowed upon us. We ask you now, Father, that your Holy Spirit will bathe your house of worship in his presence. And in, in the hearts of your people, Lord, we will draw near to you and draw near to one another in love, fellowship, and worship. Bless the service, every part of it, Lord. Remember those we've just asked for prayer, Father. We know that you're with them. You're going to bless them and keep them in your care. This we pray in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
oh, hello. You caught me reading one of my favorite stories today. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Terry, and I'm also known as a storyteller. Now, don't you guys worry. I'm not the type of storyteller like Jerry Anderson and Gary McClure, who tell about how big that fish was they caught on their latest fishing trip, but rather, my stories can change lives. This, yes, it's my Bible, and it's filled with wonderful stories. Not fairy tales like Jack and the Beanstalk, but rather stories that are true and have life-changing lessons because they came from the author of our stories, stories of what he can do. You know, some say that the word story is a shortened term for the word history. I like to call it his story. You know what? It's, this book is filled with great stories like the creation of the world, of Noah and the ark and the worldwide flood of David and Goliath. But it's also filled with one of my favorite stories. And that's the story of Jesus. Jesus, God's son, who came to this earth in the form of a baby. He ministered to everyday people like you and me. And then he died on the cross for our sins. But don't worry, he did not stay in that grave. Three days later, he rose again. And he lives forevermore. Hallelujah. You know, God was there when the world was created. He was there when water covered the entire earth and flooded it. He was also present when that giant was struck down with just one stone in a slingshot. You know, he was there also for the birth, death, and resurrection of his son. You see, God gives each one of us a story. And he wants us to share it. Now, our stories may have different elements of fear, sacrifice, and struggle. But they also have God's promise of his faithfulness, of his goodness, and his presence with us. Oh, you know what? I have one such story here that you guys have got to hear. It's one of my favorites. It's a story of hope, surprise, and prayers. It's by storytellers Anthony and Heather. Here it is. For anyone who knows me, it shouldn't, it shouldn't shock you that our story starts with a surprise. Anthony and I had been married for a few months. We had plans and then, surprise, we learned we were expecting a baby. I remember thinking, why did this happen now? But after the initial shock wore off, excitement began to grow for our little girl who was due in December. However, there were more surprises to come. I had come to West Virginia to see my newest niece, Joelle, and my body had become very swollen, and I was rest feeling very restless. My sister Ashley noticed and asked if I was feeling okay. Having never been pregnant and having entered into my third trimester, I believed what I was experiencing was to be expected. We decided to check my blood pressure and it was high, too high. So after consulting Aaron, the decision was made to go to the ER. My blood pressure was as high as 210 over 110 during that night. So needless to say, I was admitted to the hospital and I was told that I would be hospitalized until after I gave birth. The staff thought I was actually going to give birth to her that night and I was only at 31 weeks. Being away from Anthony, the fear started setting in my mind. I started praying constantly. I felt I would be okay, but wondered if Peyton would come home. It wasn't that, oh, sorry, come home with me. Sorry, guys. It wasn't what I wanted, but I knew God was in control and his will would be done and that he would get the glory. I knew he wanted me to trust him with the situation. So the surprises continued. Due to various circumstances, 
We had to be transferred, transferred for C, from CAMC to Baptist Health in Lexington, Kentucky. There, they tried to correct my blood pressure and my protein levels for five days. And the staff kept telling me that I should aim to get to at least 34 weeks. During this time, I spent many hours reading scripture, praying, and keeping my mind on Jesus. Um, on October 28th, I woke up feeling like I couldn't breathe. And for a few days, I had been telling the staff that I was struggling to get a full breath, and they just thought it was due to anxiety. So that morning when I woke, woke up, I knew I had to make sure they knew that it was not the case. So they checked my oxygen level, and I was at 80% on room air. This made them send me down to radiology for a chest x-ray, and it revealed a lot of fluid on my lungs. Therefore, I was scheduled for an emergency C-section. We had made it to 32 weeks, and at 1019, Peyton Lee arrived. Weigh, weighing two pounds, 13 ounces, whew, and measuring 13 and three-fourths inches long. I rejoiced at hearing her first cry. And after letting Peyton's sigh settle in my mind, my faith was shaken, and I struggled with leaving her alone at night but I knew God was still in control. I continued to pray, and I was reminded how important prayer is. The prayers of my family and others strengthened me. It strengthened me and used me with other moms as they shared their struggles and their victories, and I was able to pray with them. If Peyton hadn't surprised us with her early arrival, we would have, we would have missed that opportunity. We are so grateful to God for giving us his strength to make it through this trial. God is so good. After spending only four weeks in the NICU, ooh, this is my favorite part, we, ex we got to surprise my family on Thanksgiving Day with our full family of three. <laughs> All the glory belongs to God. He, I'm so glad he gave us the story of the show with you guys.
gave Anthony and Heather a different story than the one that they first envisioned. But as they turned their fear over to belief, hope, and prayers, God helped them with this unexpected surprise of Peyton to their story. Speaking of surprise babies, can you imagine how Mary, the mother of Jesus, must have felt when Gabriel came to her and said that she was going to have a baby? And she'd never even been with a man. I mean, who would actually believe that a virgin would carry a child? Matter of fact, she said, she asked the angel, she said, how can this be? And Gabriel answered her, and she believed God and what he said. You know, I've got to share this with you because when, when Gabriel left and Mary was alone again, she decided that she was going to go visit her cousin Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth was also pregnant at that time. And I want you to hear Elizabeth's words here in the book of Luke, what she says when she sees Mary coming towards her. Elizabeth said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. See, Mary had been chosen, and she was blessed. But there were still those who whispered about her situation. She gave birth to Jesus in a stable before she was married. Then she and Joseph had to flee to Egypt to avoid those who wished to harm Jesus when he was small. And then as he grew and started his earthly ministry, she watched the actions of those who still wished to harm him. You know, maybe your story has others doubting you. It could be filled with twists and turns, and, and you, you don't really see how it's going to work out. But you want to hope, and you want to believe. Can I tell you something, my friend? Something I've experienced along in my journey in this story that God's writing out for me is that he's always with me, and he'll never let me go. It may take time on this journey slow What lies ahead I'm not sure I know But the hand that holds this flailing soul he will not let go there may be days when I cannot breathe there may be scars that will stay with me but the deepest stains they will be washed clean and he will not let go when all around my soul gives way he then is all my hope and stay when grief has paralyzed my heart his grip holds even too shall pass the joy will come that the hurt won't last so I will trust that within his grasp
isn't it wonderful to know that the author of our stories is always with us and that he'll never let us go. You know, if the timeline of your story is filled with doubts and challenges, remember, God is faithful. Faithfulness. I have a fantastic story uh, just about God's faithfulness. It's Chris and Nikki's story. Yeah, it's filled with sacrifices made and lessons learned. Let's hear from them about God's faithfulness when they felt overwhelmed and broken. We're Chris and Nikki Parker, and this is our story. We've been married for 15 years and have four beautiful children ranging from ages 11 to 3. The Lord brought us together as a couple in 2000 when we spent the years separated at different colleges. Shortly after Chris's graduation in 2004, he, following the Lord's calling, joined the military. During this period of our lives, we moved eight times in a, in a span of 11 years. Chris served a total of eight years on active duty with three combat deployments before heeding the Lord's call to return home to West Virginia in 2011. So the Lord made his presence known during my time in the military. The decision to join felt right, and I possessed a peace that would help me traverse the unknown. The Lord wanted me to trust him, but I needed to be in a place where I wasn't self-sufficient. I remember a good friend gave me a bit of wisdom before my first deployment to Iraq. He said, the Lord leads a person to the desert for three reasons, to prepare for ministry, to help someone in need, and to learn a lesson. These words continue to ring true regardless if I'm in a real or proverbial desert. God has a plan and all we need to do is trust and obey. Surprisingly, after a year of being unemployed, uh, once we returned back from the military, active duty, the Lord led us back to military service. The difficulties of being unemployed at home, waiting on an opportunity, seemed overwhelming at times. The Army trained me to think and act a certain way, but being at home with a young child seemed foreign. I struggled with purpose and became frustrated at my circumstances. Nikki was close to Titus's due date, and I wanted her to remain at home for a while to pro properly recover and bond with our child. And close to the day she went to the hospital, I received an opportunity to work full-time with the West Virginia Army National Guard. The timing and the substantial provision of this assignment felt like divine appointment. God provided in a big way, but this path was fraught with continual hardships. During our time, we missed birthdays, anniversaries, important events, and everyday special moments, a truly difficult road. I want to walk you through what I call a deep valley in our story, but I also want to take you on a journey of hope. When COVID-19 hit in 2020, Chris would be activated to help lead West Virginia's COVID-19 response force. The pressures on me at home to raise four kids, continue to homeschool, and maintain difficult schedules created a monumental strain. Chris served on the state's response force for six months before reverting back to a more stable work schedule. Yet, as things finally started to slow down, we received some distressing news. Due to the West Virginia National Guard's need to fill deployment slots, the leadership selected Chris to be called at the last minute to replace another soldier for a deployment to Kuwait. Being that this was the fourth deployment for our family, you can imagine the heartache. So I can still remember the exact location when I received the deployment notification in late October. I'd heard about a few issues with a soldier and, and more than once experienced a tinge of concern. I remember praying for confirmation before informing Nikki and creating this maelstrom of stress. And even after obtaining confirmation, I put off letting her know. She figured it out and asked me pointedly about the deployment. I felt emotionally numb after telling the children a few weeks later. I put it off to extend and protect their sense of normalcy for as long as possible. All the while, God strengthened the cords of this family using trials to bind us tighter. Nothing would prepare me for what was to come. You would think, it being my fourth deployment, I'd be a pro, 
but that's not how this works. Over a nine-month period, my heart, would be continually broken. I began to face a deep depression and use words like hopeless and helpless to describe my situation. Many days I struggled to get out of bed and would just cry. I didn't want to go out of, I didn't want to get out of bed and face the day, but you know, that's not possible with four kids. Even on my best days of shouldering my pain, I was still dealing with the emotional toll it was taking on my husband and my kids. The distance had taken a toll on our marriage. The, word, the work of the Lord did by separating us and putting our focus on him alone was unimaginable. Lots of hard work took place. It, it would have never happened with Chris here because our lives got in the way. So God took both of us to the desert and started a work that would change things forever. I knew the Lord guided me here and I could handle the stress uh, and work of a deployment. The most difficult part is walking away from your family and people who need your presence and protection. The idea of willfully leaving was foreign to me and deeply sad. Soldiers, if you can't tell, can be very good at compartmentalizing their emotions, experiences and stressors. I had a lot of guilt leaving, knowing Nikki and the kids would struggle. Throughout the deployment, I struggled with loneliness and a feeling of being disconnected. I ended up spectating the lives of my wife and kids through an electronic device. Some days it felt amazing to see and hear their voices, and then other days it felt like torment, always being close but not close enough. Yet the Lord brought me to the desert this time to learn a lesson and to help others. He isolated me, and in his timing, he started his instruction. I began to take a hard look at myself, my marriage, and my parenting. God wanted to dig some things out of my heart and use this deployment to prepare me for his work. I began to take the lessons and help others, engaging in difficult topics and genuinely helping others cope with their issues. The hardships and pain I endured overseas paved the way for a joyful reunion. Life was hard. I remember one day crying out to the Lord and saying, I just can't do it anymore. And let me tell you how the Lord provided. That very evening, someone from our church messaged me saying that God had spoken to her about helping me. I cried tears of joy. This is just one example of how the Lord provided. Over the, over the course of seven months, people prepared meals, ordered meals, uh, brought us items, cleaned the house, and took my kids when I, ne when I needed a break. The most amazing part was God provided these things from people I would have never imagined. God reminded me that he is the source of my hope and provision. These people aren't helping me because I'm an awesome friend or person, but because they love the Lord. God had placed me in a Bible study group almost a year prior to this deployment. This group of women provided me with a way to share my raw emotions and feelings while paving the way for a greater friendship. Many would say, I don't know how you do it. I'll tell you how I did it. The Lord carried me. When I was too weak, he held me up. When I was too tired, he gave me strength. When I felt I couldn't go another day, he sent me relief. So when I think of our story, I think of one of hope and provision. Even when all things seem lost and you feel you cannot carry on, God is faithful. My life verse is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. One song that gave me strength was, Oh, come to the altar. I want to remind you of the value of encouragement. If God is calling you to help someone, don't delay. The impact it has on others is life altering. One can truly make a difference just by helping another. Friend, we're telling you we've been to some dark places and traveled some difficult roads, but God has always been faithful. Even when we felt hopeless and wanted to just give up, he picked us up. No matter the issue, sin, or weight you carry, 
Jesus is calling you to bring it to the altar and lay it down. and Nikki's story told of the treasure they found when they looked at their own lives and cried out to God for help. They made sacrifices so that Chris could serve his country and help others. When I think of sacrifice, I can't help but think of 
the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus made by coming to this earth and dying on the cross for our sins so that we could have everlasting life with him. And in that story too, we saw, Nikki saw how God was faithful. She was strengthened from the help of others when she needed it the most. You know, if we're honest, we've all needed that help at times. You know what? God's word is full of promises. He's given us, I'm just looking here in Deuteronomy. First of all, he says, be strong and courageous. But then he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And then he promises to be our strength when we're weak. Over here in Isaiah, it says, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And in Jeremiah, he tells us, I know the, the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. They're plans for welfare and not calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And over in Philippians, it's one of my favorite epistles that Paul wrote. Paul tells us, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And then... The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. God gives us promises of his presence, strength, and hope. <laughs> There's one more story I can't not share. We have to hear this one. It's John and Tina's story. It's a story of God's promises and his presence. I'm John Thaxton. This is my wife, Tina Thaxton. This is our family. Um, we have three children. Our oldest son. I'm John Thaxton. This is my wife, Tina Thaxton. This is our family. Um, we have three children. Our oldest son is JT. This is his wife, Sierra, and our wonderful granddaughter, Ellie, who we are so blessed to have. Um, our middle son, Joel, and then our daughter, Amy. Um, we are so blessed with our family. Um, we have such a support group with our family, our children. They have been wonderful. Um, wouldn't know what we would do without our children. Um, they have been here for us through everything. And we have raised our kids in the church and um, all of them are saved. We have, um, they love the Lord and blessed tremendously. So love love the, the Lord with all their hearts and amazed with that. Um, we learned about my illness. Um, I grew up knowing that I had been sick. Um, I had problems my whole life. Wasn't really sure what was going on. Um, knew I had some problems, but um, the doctors kind of put it off, but a few years back, my daughter started having problems as well. Um, we went to a geneticist and I was diagnosed first with what was called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. It is a genetic illness. Um, I ended up in the hospital September of 2018. Uh, my digestive system shut down. Um, 
I eventually ended up at Cleveland Clinic and had to have a feeding tube. Um, I continued to have problems um, as well. Uh, I had passed that condition to my daughter. Ended up a year later in 2019 um, with a new geneticist. Um, I was diagnosed with a second genetic illness. Um, I have inherited myopathy, which is also a genetic condition. Um, Ehlers Downloads attacks your connective tissue disorder, your connective tissue throughout your whole body. Um, basically, that means we dislocate joints on a daily basis. Um, it also attacks your stomach. It can attack basically every part of your body. Inherited myopathy attacks the muscles in your body. Um, it'll attack your heart, your lungs. Um, I recently found out that my heart function has dropped. My lung functions have dropped. Um, I am scheduled to have an ileostomy put in in March. Um, basically, all the muscles have started to stop working in my body. Um, my father passed away when I was nine from a heart attack, and they think that I inherited it from him. So. I do have to watch um, now because my heart can stop. Um, my lungs can stop working. So, um, you know, you do live with the constant fear of that you can die from this condition. It is a possibility, which is very scary. Um, but I do know that I am saved and that is a piece that I have. Um, I, I'm not really scared about that. And without our faith in God's grace, we there's no way that we could have made it this far. It's, it's been a, a rough journey for sure. There's been plenty of speed bumps, a lot of lows and valleys, but there's been a lot of prayer from the church and, and church membership uh, for us and outreach from the church to us that's helped us get through these times. I mean, God's grace has been sufficient. It's been, it's hard at times. But without that, we would, we would not have made it this far, for sure. Yes. But I, I, I'm very thankful for the church as well. The church has always been here for us and, and prayed with us and the prayers are felt um, so much. That right there and God's, God's, God's um, hand on us is, is felt so much through all this time. And I, and I think that is, if anybody ever asks, what can we do, pray pray and you know and just ask for God's strength through this and and th that's know. to have God walk us through the most difficult times in our life and and you feel it you can actually feel it and I know that I there are times when I I've needed that lift and I can actually feel that presence with me and know that he is right there beside me you can never ask for anything more. So uh, that's that right there is is the best thing I think I could have is right there. It's God with me through all of this. So in 
instead of the struggles I'm facing, let me tell of the Savior I know, how His Word is today and for always, so I'll always have a reason to We can trust the promises of God. Everything he's promised, he will do. Hey, have you guys noticed how all these stories that were told today have a familiar common theme weaved throughout? Patterns of God's hope, of his strength, of his faithfulness and his presence. All things that come from his story. His story of love by sending Jesus to us and then while he was here by showing his father's love ultimately by dying on the cross for our sins and rising again. You see all these things that come from his story that he wants for us to share in our story. You know, I have to ask you a question today. Has his story become part of your story? If not, it's not too late for it to become part of it. All you have to do is simply confess that you're a a sinner in need of a Savior. Ask him into your life to be your Lord. And he promises he will come in and he will help guide you throughout this life. And for those of you who have accepted, he wants you to share your story. Become a storyteller like me. As long as we have breath, our stories are not finished. God wants you to share your story too.
Oh, and my story? Well, we don't have time for it today. But if we did, it would probably sound something like this. If I told you my story, you would hear hope that wouldn't let go. If I told you my story, you would hear love that never gave up. And if I told you my story, you would hear life, but it wasn't mine. If I should speak, then let it be of the grace that is greater than all my sin, of when justice was served and when mercy went, of the kindness of Jesus that draws me in. Oh, to tell you my story is to tell I If I told you my story, you would hear victory over the enemy. And if I told you my story, you would hear freedom that was won for me. And if I told you my story, you would hear life overcome the grave. If I should speak, then let was served and when mercy wins of the kindness of Jesus that draws me in oh to tell you my story is to tell of the grace that is greater than all my sin of when justice was served and when blessing my cup got full the question has been asked has his story become your story the story of Jesus 
has it become your story, center of your life? You see, Jesus, he writes his story, first of all, into our hearts, a private, powerful, life change decision where we meet him at Calvary and we see the empty tomb. He writes his story of salvation into our heart. And then, my friends, the journey begins. The difficulties, the perplexing situations. But he writes his story across our life for all to see. Has his story become your story? You know, each of these families, each of these families have met, they have wept and worshipped in the presence of Jesus. They have come to a decision years ago at Calvary for salvation, but continual coming into the presence of Jesus and allowing him to have control of their life and to write a story that brings glory to him in the midst of difficulty. You know, this is my story. It reminds me of a text in Scripture, and I will only be five more minutes this morning. But there's key words throughout this whole program this morning that are found in this text. That's what drove me there. And I want you to see this text because it's the story of Jesus once we meet him at salvation and we journey with him in life, this text describes the Christian life. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 through 10. I'll read it. But we have this treasure, the treasure of Christ. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the excellence of the power from God is shown to be from God, not from us. Oh, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Oh, we are struck down, but not destroyed, because we have purpose. And here's the purpose of the Christian life. We always carry about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus might shine forth from our bodies. Has his story become part of your story? I see three things in this text, and I just want you to see them in an outline form. Take them home. Let's let him write the story he's writing across our life for all the world to see. First of all, we have treasure Secondly, we have difficulty. And thirdly, we have purpose. Folks, we have treasure because we have Christ. The text said it. The text said we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have Christ abiding with us forever. We have his spirit. You know, Peter summed it up this way. He said this, the Father has begotten us again to living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus our Lord, we have treasure because Christ is with us through it all. We have treasure. And not only that, oh, we have difficulty. Hard-pressed, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Struck down, but not destroyed. My friends, I want you to know that we have difficulty, but God is faithful, and we are loved. I love what Paul said in Romans when he said, I have become persuaded of something that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities or powers, nothing present today, nothing that's coming into my story tomorrow will separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have his treasure within us. We have difficulty, but he is faithful. Now we have purpose. We've seen just three stories shared this morning of 
Christ calling these families to greater purpose. And through it all, they rose to the occasion and the grace of God just drips from their lives and we see him all over their life. We have purpose always a bearing about in this body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Why would we do that? So the life of Jesus might be made manifest through our bodies. Friends, we got purpose. For me to live is Christ. We have purpose. The life of Jesus is to live for Jesus. We have purpose. The purpose of Jesus draws us to freedom. It draws us to victory. I love this scripture that says, I am crucified with Christ. I'm emaciated. I am suppressed with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. We have purpose above all people on the globe today. The disciple of Jesus Christ has treasure. Oh, we've got difficulty, but we've got purpose. We live to the praise of his glory. So I ask you one final time, has his story become your story? Jesus writes these kind of things into your life. Hope that won't let go. Love that never gives up. Victory over the enemy. Freedom won for me. Life that overcomes even the grave. Has his story become your story? You see, Jesus teaches us there's grace that is greater than all of my sin. Justice has been served and mercy wins. The kindness of Jesus will keep calling you in. Oh, to tell you my story is to tell of him. Has his story become the centerpiece of your life? Would you bow your heads right there where you're at this morning as we conclude this service? We would hear the background music of that song, that theme song, My Story. And right now, just make this a place of prayer, a house of prayer. Some are calling on Jesus because part of the story going on in your life is too much for you to bear. His presence must come to you. Acknowledge him right now this morning in prayer. Turn that chapter of the story over to Jesus. While Christians are praying, just yielding the control of our story to the Savior. I would ask you this morning, is there anyone here that would say, I need Jesus Christ to enter my life, save my soul, and lead me from this day forth. Oh, call on him right now. He will not turn you away. Call on him and say, Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. I know you rose from the grave. And today, here and now, at this house of worship, I call on you to become my Savior. Forgive me of my sins and lead my life from this day forward. Has his story become the centerpiece of your life? Go to him in prayer right now. Father, in the sweetness of this moment, we believe your children have been blessed. I know our church is just filled with the sense of your presence this morning. And we thank you for the treasure of Christ that has been delivered to us.
through the cross and the empty tomb. And we have that treasure. Thank you for your faithfulness during difficulty. And thank you for the purpose to just allow you to glorify your name through our lives. So we give thanks today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And today, if you have any spiritual question of any type that is uh, just a little more than what was addressed and you would like to nail anything specific down, would you please see one of our ushers in the lobby, one of our pastors, we are here today ready to remain with the Bible with you after service. Now, before we go home, I want to say thank you. And I think you want to say thank you to a few folks. So for just a moment here, just hold your applause until I get to the end of this list. But I just want to remind us of what all has gone into what we've experienced this morning. I want to uh, say a great thank you to uh, Debbie Naylor's leadership with our choir and all that are in the choir. We so appreciate them. Our soloists, Sarah Bledsoe and Wesley Henderson. Our quartet, Eric and Sherry Hudnell, Marvin Eastep, and Rodney Young. And our script writer, Tammy Tremblay. Those up in the sound room, they have had their hands full this morning, computer crashing right in the middle of things. They pulled through. Our media men, Mike Farrell, Kevin Allman, Bill Queen, and Pastor Joshua. Our storytellers, our sister Sarah, uh, Terry Hanshue, Anthony and Heather Parsons, Chris and Nikki Parker, John and Tina Faxton, and last but not least, our props and decorations that you see here today have been done by Sharon Holcomb, Doug and Terry Shan Hanshue, Heather Parsons, Emma White, and once again, Pastor Joshua. Have you been blessed this morning? Amen. All right, let's give some gratitude for these folks. As well. All right, now here's your assignment. You need to stand up in just a moment. Stand up, go out, and share his story in your life. Go out there. God bless you.